Chapter Twenty One of Devlin the Barber by B. L. Fargen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A sacred and holy pledge, said Devlin. From me? Is it possible that you ask me to bind myself to you by a pledge that you deem holy and sacred? I know of no other way to secure your assistance, I said, feeling the weight of the sneer. If you did, you would adopt it? Assuredly. So that, after all, you are to a certain extent in my power. As you to a certain extent are in mine. A fair retort. Before I point out to you how illogical and inconsistent you are, let me thank you for having converted what promised to be a dull evening into a veritable entertainment. It is a real cause for gratitude in such a house as Lemons, of whom I have already spoken disparagingly, but of whom I cannot speak disparagingly enough. My dear sir, that person is devoid of colour, his moral and physical qualities are feeble his intellect may be said to be washed out. It is the bold, the daring, that recommends itself to me, although I admit that there are curious studies to be found among the meanest of mortals. Now, my dear sir, for your inconsistency and your lack of the logical quality, my worthy landlady has conveyed to you an impression of me which, to describe it truthfully, may be designated unearthly. How much farther it goes I will not inquire. Her small capacity has instilled into what, as a compliment, I will call her mind, a belief that I am not exactly human, in point of fact that if I am not the evil one himself, I am at least one of his satellites. Common people are inclined to such extravagances. They believe in apparitions, vampires, and supernatural signs, or, to speak more correctly, in signs which they believe to be supernatural the most ordinary coincidences, and think, my dear sir, that there are myriads of circumstances, of more or less importance, occurring every twenty-four hours in this motley world, and that it is a mathematical certainty that a certain proportion of these myriads should be coeval and should bear some relation to each other, the most ordinary coincidences, I repeat, are outrageously magnified by their imaginations when, say, sickness or death is concerned. A woman wakes up in the night, and in the darkness hears a ticking, tick, tick, tick. She rises in the morning, and hears that her mother-in-law has died during the night. "'Bless my soul!' she exclaims. "'I knew it! I knew it! Last night I woke up all of a tremble,' which she did not, but that is a detail, and heard the death tick. The story, being told to the neighbours, invests this woman, who is proud of having received a supernatural warning, with supreme importance. She becomes for a time a social star. She relates the story again and again, and each time adds something which her imagination supplies, until, in the end, it is settled that her mother-in-law died at the precise moment she woke up that she saw the ghost of that person at her bedside, very ghastly and sulphury, in the moonlight, it is always moonlight on these occasions, that the ghost whispered in sepulchral tones, I am dying, good-bye, that there was a long wail, and that then she jumped out of bed and screamed, My mother-in-law is dead. This is the story after it has grown. What are the facts? The woman has eaten a heavy supper and she sleeps not so well as usual. She wakes up in the middle of the night. In the kitchen a mouse creeps on to the dresser, after some crumbs of bread and cheese which are in a plate. The ever-watchful cat, I love cats, especially good mousers, jumps upon the dresser with the intention of making a meal of the mouse. On the dresser, then, at this precise moment, are the plate containing the crumbs of bread and cheese, the mouse and the cat. There are other things there, of course, but there is only one other thing connected with the story, and that is a jug half full of water. The cat, jumping after the mouse, overturns this jug, and the water flows till it reaches the edge of the dresser, whence it drips, drips, drips upon the floor. This is the tick, 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 which the woman upstairs hears, the death tick of her mother-in-law. Her mother-in-law is eighty-seven years of age and has been ill for months. Her death is daily expected. 
She dies on this night, and the story is complete. A dying old woman, eighty-seven years of age, her daughter-in-law, who has eaten too much supper, a plate of crumbs, a jug with water in it, a cat, and a mouse. Of these simple materials is a message from the unseen world created, which enthralls the entire neighbourhood. Analyze the miracles handed down from ancient times, some of which are woven into the religious beliefs of the people, and you will find that they are composed of parts as common and vulgar. I made no attempt to interrupt Devlin in his narration of this commonplace story. He had, when he chose to exercise it, a singularly fascinating manner, and his voice was melodious, and when he paused I felt as if I had been listening to an attractive romance. While he spoke his fingers were playing with a pen-holder and a pencil which were on the table. The pen-holder was long, the pencil was short, and I observed that he had placed one upon the other in the form of a cross. "'I am dull, perhaps,' I said, but I do not see how your story proves me to be illogical and inconsistent." "'I related it,' replied Devlin, looking at the cross, simply to show how willing people are to believe in the supernatural. My worthy landlady believes that I am a supernatural being. Her husband believes it. You are inclined to lend a ready ear to it. And yet you tell me that you will be satisfied with a sacred and holy pledge from me, knowing, if you are at all correct in your estimate of me, that such a pledge is as of much weight and value as a soap-bubble. How easy for me to give you this pledge! and all the while I may be a direct accessory in the tragedy you have resolved to unriddle. "'I thank you for reminding me,' I said. "'You shall swear to me that you have had no hand in this most horrible and dastardly murder.' "'More inconsistency, more lack of logical perception,' he said, and the magnetism in his eyes compelled me to fix my gaze upon the cross on the table. "'You ask me to swear, and you will be content with my oath.' I render you my obligations for your faith in my veracity. How shall I swear? How shall I deliver myself of the sacred and holy pledge? There are so many forms, so many symbols of pledging one's mortal heart and immortal soul. The civilized Jew, when he is married to his beloved under the canopy, grinds a wine-glass to dust with the heel of his boot, and the guests and relatives, especially the relatives of the bride, lift up their voices in joyful praise, with the conscious self-delusion that this sacred rite ensures the faithfulness of the bridegroom to the woman he has wedded. Some burn wax candles, very bad wax often, for the release of souls from purgatory. The Chinaman, called upon for his oath, blows out a candle, twists the neck of a terrified cock, or smashes a saucer. The Christian kisses the New Testament, the Jew kisses the Old. The Christian swears with his hat off, the Jew with his hat on. I could multiply anomalies, all opposed to each other. Which kind of obligation would you prefer from me? A cock or a hen? Produce the sacred symbol, and I am ready. Shall my head be covered or uncovered? As you please. Ah, how strange! With this pencil and pen-holder my fingers have insensibly formed a cross. Shall I swear upon that, and will it content you? Take your choice, my dear sir, take your choice. Call me Jew, Christian, Pagan, Chinaman, which you please. I am willing to oblige you. Or shall we be sensible? Will you take my simple word for it? I will, I said, but I must have a hostage. Anything, anything, my dear sir give it a name. Your desk, I said, which not unlikely contains private writings and confessions. It does, he replied, tapping on the desk with his knuckles. You little dream of the treasures, the strange secrets herein contained. You would have this as a hostage? I would. It shall be yours, on the understanding that if I claim it from you within three months, after the mystery of the murder of Lizzie Melladew is cleared up, you will deliver it to me again intact, with its contents unread. I promise faithfully, I said. I must trouble you, he said, and he suddenly placed his hand upon my forehead and stood over me. Yes, he said, resuming his seat, the promise is faithfully made. You will keep it. 
He locked the desk, and pushed it across the table to me, putting the key in his pocket. "'And now, your word of truth and honour," I said. "'Give me your hand. On my truth and honour I pledge myself to you. Moreover, if it will ease your mind of an absurd suspicion, I declare, on my truth and honour, that I have had nothing whatever to do with this murder." His words carried conviction with them. "'But you will assist me in my search?' I said. "'To the extent of my power. Understand, however, that I do not undertake that your search shall be successful. It does not depend upon me. Accident will probably play its part in the matter. There is a clause, moreover, in our agreement, to which I require your adhesion. It is that during your search you will do nothing to fasten publicity upon me, and that, in the event of your succeeding, I shall not be dragged into the case. "'Unless you are required as a witness,' I said. "'I shall not be required. I have no evidence to offer which a court of law would accept. Who is to be the judge of that? You yourself.' I agree. You must not regard me as a spy upon your movements when I tell you I shall sleep in this house to-night. Not at all. That you are a man of metal, a man who can form a resolution and carry it out, never mind at what inconvenience to yourself, makes your company agreeable to me. I like you. I accept you as my comrade, for a brief space, in lieu of that miserable groveller Lemon, who has no more strength of nerve than a jellyfish sleep in the house and welcome sleep in this room where i asked looking around for the accommodation a shakedown on the floor our mutual good friend mrs lemon shall bring up a mattress a pillow a sheet and a pair of blankets and you shall lie snug and warm i do not offer you my own bed for i know that having the instincts of a gentleman you would not accept it but i offer you the hospitality of my poor apartment we will sup together, we will sleep together, in the morning we will breakfast together, and we will go out to business together, you taking the position of poor Lemon, whom, from this moment, I cast off for ever. What say you?" I debated with myself. It was important that I should not lose sight of Devlin. Left to my own resources, I should not know how to proceed. I depended entirely upon him to supply me with a clue but what could be his reason for proposing that we should go out to business together? Of what use could I be in a barber's shop, and how would my presence there assist me? As, however, he appeared to be dealing frankly and honestly, my best course, perhaps, would be to do the same. Therefore I put the question which perplexed me in plain language. "'My dear sir,' he replied, "'in my place of business, and in no other place, shall we be able to find a starting-point. Do not entail upon me the necessity of saying, upon my truth and honour, to everything I advance. Have confidence in me, and you will be a thousand pounds the richer, probably two, if the gentleman who made you the offer keeps his word. I hesitated no longer. I would act frankly and boldly, and for the next twenty-four hours at least would be guided by him. I accept your hospitality, I said, and will do as you wish. Good, he said, rubbing his hands, we may regard the campaign as opened. Woe to the murderer! Justice shall overtake him. He shall hang! He uttered these words in a tone of malignant satisfaction, and as though the prospect of any man being hanged was thoroughly agreeable to him. I will prove to you, he continued, how completely you can trust me. You came here to-day with the intention of returning home and sleeping there. Your absence will alarm your wife. You must write to her." He placed note-paper and envelopes before me, and took from the mantel-shelf a penny-stone bottle of ink, then pointed to the pen which formed part of the cross upon the table. I wrote a line to my wife, informing her that events of great importance had occurred in relation to the murder of Lizzie Melladew, and that, for the purpose of following up the threads of a possible discovery, I intended to sleep out to-night. I desired her in my letter to go and see Mr. Portland, and tell him that I was engaged in the task he had entrusted to me, and believed I should soon be in possession of a clue. "'Have no anxiety for me,' I said. "'I am quite safe, and no harm will befall me. 
the prospect of unravelling this dreadful mystery fills me with joy she would know what i meant by this the murderer discovered we should be comparatively rich i fastened and addressed my letter it should reach her hands to-night said devlin how will you send it i stepped to the window and looking out distinguished the figures of george carton and mr kenneth dowsett mr dowsett seemed to be endeavouring unavailingly to persuade his ward to come away with him i could employ no better messenger than george carton he should take my letter to my wife returning to the centre of the room my eyes fell upon devlin's desk devlin smiled and nodded he knew what was passing in my mind i shall send my letter i said by the hands of george carton who is still in the square and i shall send your desk with it do so said devlin i opened the envelope and tearing it into very small pieces flung them out of the window devlin smiled again so that i should not discover your address he said that is it i replied it is likely he said to be not very far from mr melladew because you and he are friends i added a few words to my letter desiring my wife to put the desk in a place of safety and then addressing another envelope i went downstairs bearing both desk and letter i shall be here when you come back said devlin even were i protein i shall not change my shape my word is given on my way to the street door i encountered fanny lemon well sir she asked anxiously i will speak to you presently i said and opening the street door crossed the road to where george carton and his guardian were standing End of chapter 21chapter 22 of devlin the barber by b l fargin this librivox recording is in the public domain this foolish headstrong lad will be the death of me said mr dowsett in a fretful tone and of himself as well i am neither foolish nor headstrong retorted the unhappy young man i told you he was in there still and you told me he had left the house i said it for your good said mr dowsett but you will not be ruled no i will not exclaimed george carton violently and then said remorsefully i beg you to forgive me for speaking so wildly it is the height of ingratitude after all your goodness to me but do you not see for god's sake do you not see that you are making things worse instead of better for me by opposing me as you are doing i will have my way i will whether i am right or wrong my poor boy said mr dowsett addressing me has got it into his foolish head that you can be of some assistance to him in heaven's name how can you be mr dowsett i said and the strange experiences of the last few days imported i felt a solemnity into my voice the ends of justice are sometimes reached by roads we cannot see it may be so in this sad instance there said george carton to his guardian in a tone of melancholy triumph did i not tell you mr dowsett shrugged his shoulders impatiently and said i declare that if i did not love my ward with a love as sincere and perfect as any human being ever felt for another i would wash my hands of this business altogether but why said carton with much affection do you torment yourself about it at all it is you i torment myself about said mr dowsett not the horrible deed i love you with a father's love and i cannot leave you in the state you are george carton put his arm around his guardian caressingly i am not worth it he murmured i am not worth it but i cannot act otherwise than i do sir to me i have lingered here in the hope that you might have some news to tell me i have nothing i can communicate to you i said but rest assured that my interest in the discovery of the murderer is scarcely less than yours i have taken up the search and i will not rest while there is the shadow of a hope left i knew it i knew it said george carton knowing it then i said and receiving the assurance from my lips will you do me a service and be guided by my advice i will indeed i will 
replied Carton. "'It is heartbreaking,' said Mr. Dowsett mournfully, turning his head, "'to find a stranger's counsel preferred to mine.' "'No, no!' cried George Carton. "'I declare to you, no! But you would have me do nothing, and I cannot obey you. I cannot, I cannot sit idly down, and make no effort in the cause of justice. My dear Lizzie is dead, and I do not care to live. But I will live for one thing, revenge. Be calm, I said, taking the young man's fevered hand, and listen to me. I wish you to take this letter and desk to my wife, and deliver them to her with your own hands. Will you do so? Yes. You must not part with them under any pretext or persuasion until you place them in my wife's possession. No one shall touch them till she receives them. You must go at once, for she is anxious about me. I intend to sleep here to-night, and when you have done what I ask you, I beg you to go home with your guardian and have a good night's rest." He looked discontented at this, but Mr. Dowsett said, "'Be persuaded, George, be persuaded.' "'Believe me,' I said, speaking very earnestly, "'that it will be for the best.' "'Very well, sir, I will do as you desire. But,' turning to Mr. Dowsett, "'no opiates. If sleep comes to me, it shall come naturally.' "'I promise you, George,' said Mr. Dowsett, "'and now let us go. Thank you, sir, thank you a thousand times, for having prevailed upon my ward to do what is right. Come, George, come.' He was so anxious to get the young man away that he advanced a few steps quickly. Thus, for two or three moments, Carton and I were alone. "'Shall I see you to-morrow, sir?' asked Carton. "'In all probability,' I replied, "'but do not seek me here. I have your address, and will either call upon or write to you.' "'Then I am to remain home all day?' "'Yes. By following my instructions you will be rendering me practical assistance.' very well sir i put all my trust in you are you coming george cried mr dowsett looking back yes i am ready said the young man joining his guardian and presently they were both out of sight i re-entered the house fanny lemon was still in the passage fanny i said i cannot keep long with you as i have business upstairs with mr devlin but I wish to impress upon you not to speak to a single soul of what has passed between us to-day. Say nothing to anybody about Mr. Lemon being ill, and, above all, do not call in a doctor. Doctors are apt to be inquisitive, and it is of the highest importance that curiosity shall not be aroused in the minds of the neighbours. There is nothing radically wrong with Lemon. He has received a fright, and his nerves are shaken. That is all. Tell him that I have taken his place with Devlin, and that the partnership is at an end. That will relieve his mind. Keep him quiet, and give him nothing to drink but milk or barley water. Lower his system, Fanny, lower his system. "'Don't you think it low enough already, sir?' asked Fanny. "'I do not. He is in a state of dangerous excitement, and everything must be done to soothe and quiet him. But I have no more time to waste. You will do as I have told you?' "'Yes, sir, I'll be careful to. But are you sure he don't want a doctor? Are you sure he won't die?' "'Quite sure, and you can tell him, if you like, that I say it is all right.' "'Is it all right, sir?' "'If it isn't, I'm going to make it so. I shall sleep here to-night, Fanny.' "'And welcome, sir. We haven't a spare bedroom, but I can make you up a bed on the sofa in the parlour. I shall not need it. I am going to sleep in Devlin's room, on the floor. She caught my arm with a cry of alarm. Has he got hold of you too, sir? The Lord save us! He's got the lot of us in his claws. Don't be absurd, I said. I know what I'm about, and Mr. Devlin will find me a match for him. No more questions. Do as you are bid. If you have a mattress and some bedclothes to spare, bring them up at once. I won't look at him, sir. I won't speak to him. Oh, how shall I ever forgive myself? How shall I ever forgive myself?" She threw her apron, which during my absence she had put on over her faded black silk dress, over her head, and swayed to and fro in the passage, moaning and groaning in great distress of mind. 
I pulled the apron from her face, and gave her a good shaking by way of corrective. She ceased her moans. "'I have no patience with you, Fanny,' I exclaimed. "'In heaven's name, what do you want to be forgiven for?' "'For dragging you into this horrible business, sir,' she said, with a tendency to relapse, which I immediately checked by another shaking. "'That, that devil, upstairs!' This time I shook her so soundly that she could not get out another word for the chattering of her teeth. "'No more, Fanny,' I said roughly, "'or you will make me angry. I know what I am about, and if you don't stop instantly and do exactly as I bid you, I'll leave you and your lemon to your fate. Do you hear?' The threat terrified her into calmness. "'I'll bring up the bed thing, sir,' she said with bated breath. "'And lose no time,' I said, as I mounted the stairs. "'I won't, sir.' Devlin was smoking when I joined him, and not smoking a pipe, but a cigar with a most delicious fragrance. "'Take one,' he said, pushing a cigar-case over to me. "'You will find them good. I manufactured them while you were away.' I bore good-humouredly with his banter, and I took a cigar from the case, but did not immediately light it. "'Sent your letter?' he inquired curtly. Yes. And my desk? Yes. By Lizzie Melladew's sweetheart? Yes. Not by the other? No. Do they live together? Yes. Do you know where? Yes. Capital, he said, with the air of a man who had been asking important instead of trivial questions. There is a knock at the door, a frightened, feminine knock. Enter, my dear Mrs. Lemon, enter. Fanny Lemon came in, smothered with a mattress, sheets, blankets, and pillows, and, without uttering a word, proceeded to make the bed on the floor. "'You have brought plenty of pillows, Fanny,' I remarked. "'I thought you'd like to lay high, sir,' she whispered. Devlin broke out into a loud laugh. "'Most people do,' he said, "'while they live. When they die they all lie low. All of them. All of them.' For a moment I thought that Fanny was going to run away, but a look from me restrained her, and she finished making the bed. "'Do you wish anything else, sir?' she asked, still in a whisper, and keeping her back to Devlin. "'Yes, my charming landlady, yes,' replied Devlin, "'a large pot of your exquisite tea. Fly!' "'Make it, Fanny, and bring it up,' I said. She flew, and returned with the steaming pot. Surely never was tea so quickly prepared before. The pot, milk, sugar, and two cups and saucers were on a tray, which, without raising her eyes, she placed before me. "'Here, here!' cried Devlin, tapping the table. "'Before me, my dear creature, I am the host on this occasion.' She slid the tray over to him, and he made a motion as if he were about to place his hand on her. "'If you lay a finger on me,' she exclaimed, beating a hasty retreat from the table, "'I'll scream the house down!' "'Leave the room,' I said sternly, "'and call us at seven in the morning.' "'We shall be here, my dear creature,' added Devlin. "'You will find both of us safe and sound, ready to do justice to your excellent cooking. I have a premonition of a fine appetite for breakfast. Cook me an extra rasher.' I saw in Fanny's eyes a desire to say a word to me alone. Devlin saw it, too. "'Humour her,' he said, and quoted a line from a comedy. "'What is the use of a friend if you can't make a stranger of him?' I followed Fanny into the passage. "'You've quite made up your mind, sir?' "'Quite, Fanny.' "'Take this, sir,' she said, pushing a hard substance into my hands. "'If anything happens in the night, spring it.' It was a policeman's rattle. "'I don't know where Lemon got it from,' she said, "'but we've had it in the house for years.' "'Pshaw, Fanny,' I said, forcing the rattle back into her hands. "'You are too ridiculous.' Yet when I was once again face to face with Devlin, with the door locked, I could not help thinking that I was acting a perilous part in putting myself, as it were, into his power. He might kill me while I slept. I determined to keep awake, and to lie down in my clothes. "'Have some tea?' he asked. "'Thank you,' I replied. The tea would assist me in my resolve not to sleep. 
The teapot being emptied, I lit the cigar Devlin had given me. "'I owe you an explanation,' he said, puffing the smoke from his cigar into a series of circles. "'I take it as a fact that Lemon is suffering from some kind of prophetic vision in connection with the murder of Lizzie Melladew in Victoria Park on Friday night.' "'It is so,' I said. "'Part of my explanation lies in the admission that he received that forewarning from me.' then you knew it was done i cried i did not know it passed through the mind of a customer whose hair i was dressing i do not call that knowing a thing i am something of a thought reader my dear sir and i possess a certain power under suitable conditions of conveying my impressions to another person that is the extent of my explanation excuse me for making it so brief never in my life had i smoked a cigar with a fragrance so exquisite not only exquisite but overpowering it beguiled my senses and had such an effect upon me that the last twenty or thirty words uttered by devlin seemed to be spoken at a great distance from me this sense of distance affected not only his voice but himself and all surrounding things he and they seemed to recede into space as it were not bounded by the walls of the small apartment in which we were sitting. I had a dim desire to continue the conversation, and to press Devlin to be more explicit, but it died away. Everything floated in a mist around me, and in this state I fell asleep. End of chapter 22「Chapter Twenty Three of Devlin the Barber by B. L. Fargin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Devlin was up and dressed when I awoke in the morning. I had not to go through the trouble of putting on my clothes, as I had not taken them off the previous night. It would not have surprised me to find that I had unconsciously sought repose in the usual way, or that I had risen in my sleep to undress nothing indeed would very much have surprised me so strange had been my dreaming fancies naturally they all turned upon devlin and the case upon which i was engaged i could easily write a chapter upon them but i will content myself with briefly describing one of the strangest of them all i was sitting in a chair opposite a mirror in which i saw everything that was passing in the room devlin was standing over me dressing my hair suddenly i saw a sharp surgical instrument in his hand that is not a razor i said and i don't want to be shaved my dear sir remarked devlin with excessive politeness what you want or what you don't want matters little with that he made a straight cut across the top of my head and laid bare my brains i saw them and every little cell in them quite distinctly to think, he observed, as he peered into the cavities, that in this small compass should abide the passions, the emotions, the meanness, the noble aspirations, the sordid desires, the selfish instincts and the power to resist them, the sense of duty, the conscious deceits, the lust for power, the grovelling worship, the filthy qualities of animalism, the secret promptings, and all the motley mental and moral attributes which make a man to think that from this small compass have sprung all that constitutes man's history, religion, ethics, the rise and fall of nations, music, poetry, law, and science. How grand, how noble does this man who represents humankind think himself! What works he has executed, what marvels discovered! But if the truth were known, he is a mere dabbler, who, out of his conceit, magnifies the smallest of molehills into the largest of mountains. He can build a bridge, but he cannot make a flower that shall bloom to-day and die to-morrow. He can destroy, but he cannot create. In the open pages of nature he makes the most trivial of discoveries, and he straightway writes himself up in letters of gold and builds monuments in his honour. The stars mock him, the mountains of snow look loftily down upon the pygmy, the gossamer fly which his eyes can scarcely see triumphs over his highest efforts. But he has invented for himself a supreme shelter for defeat and decay. Dear me! Dear me! I cannot find it! 
"'What are you looking for?' I asked. "'Be kind enough to leave my brains alone.' for he was industriously probing them with some sensitive instrument. "'I am looking for your grand invention, your soul. I am wondrously wise, but I have never yet been able to discover its precise locality.' After some further search he shut up my head, so to speak, and my fancies took another direction. All these vagaries seemed to be tumbling over each other in my brain as I rose from my bed on the floor. "'Had a good night?' asked Devlin. "'If being asleep,' I replied, "'means having a good night, I have had it. But my head is in a whirl nevertheless.' "'Keep it cool if you can,' said Devlin, "'for what you have to go through. You will find water and soap inside.' He pointed to the little closet adjoining his room, and there I found all that was necessary for my toilet. I had just finished when Fanny knocked at the door. "'It's all right, Fanny,' I cried. "'You can get breakfast ready.' "'And don't forget,' added Devlin, "'the extra rasher for me. "'How is dear Lemon?' That she did not reply, and was heard beating a hasty retreat, caused a broad grin to spread over Devlin's face. "'I have provided,' he said, "'for that worthy creature something of an entertaining, not to say enthralling nature, which she can dilate upon to the last hour of her life.' and yet she is not grateful. We went down to breakfast, and there I was offered an opportunity of verifying the subtle likeness in Devlin's face to the portrait of Lemon on the wall, the evil-looking bird in its glass case, and the stone figure, half monster, half man, on the mantel-shelf. "'There is a likeness,' said Devlin pleasantly, "'between my works and me, and if you will attribute me with anything human, you can attribute it to a common human failing.' It springs from the vanity and the weakness of man that he can evolve only that which is within himself. Nowhere is that vanity and weakness more conspicuous than in Genesis, in the very first chapter, my dear sir, where man himself has had the audacity to write that God created man in his own image. My dear Mrs. Lemon, you have excelled yourself this morning. This rasher is perfect, and your cooking of these eggs to the infinitesimal part of a second is a marvel of art." Fanny did not open her lips to him, and the meal passed on in silence, so far as she was concerned. I made a good breakfast, and Devlin expressed approval of my appetite. "'It will strengthen you,' he said, "'for what is before you.' Fanny looked up in alarm, and Devlin laughed. I may mention that the first thing I did when I came downstairs was to run to the nearest newspaper shop and purchase copies of the morning papers. "'Is there anything new concerning the murder?' asked Devlin. Fanny waited breathlessly for my reply. "'Nothing,' I said. "'Have any arrests been made?' "'None.' "'Of course,' observed Devlin sarcastically. "'The police are on the track of the murderer.' there is something to that effect in the papers." Fudge, said Devlin. Breakfast over, Devlin said he would go up to his room for a few minutes, and bade me be ready when he came down. Alone with Fanny, she asked me whether I would like to see Lemon, adding that it would do him a power of good. "'Is he any better?' I asked. "'I really think he is,' she replied. "'What I told him last night about your taking up the case was a comfort to him though he ain't easy in his mind about you. He is afraid that Devlin will get hold of you as he did of him. He will not, Fanny. We shall get along famously together." She shook her head. I failed to convince her, as I failed to convince Mr. Lemon, that I should prove a match for their lodger. Lemon presented a ludicrous picture, sitting up in bed with an old-fashioned nightcap on. "'Don't go with him, sir,' he whispered, to the twisted cow. I shall go with him, I said, wherever he proposes to take me. I could not help smiling at Lemon's expression of melancholy as I made this statement. He dared not give utterance to his fears of what my ultimate destination would be if I continued to keep company with Devlin. When that strange personage came down I was ready for him, and we went out together. Fanny, looking after us from the street door, shaking, I well knew, in her inward soul, Devlin made himself exceedingly pleasant. 
and the comments he passed on the people we met excited my admiration and increased my wonder. He seemed to be able to read their characters in their faces, and although I would have liked to combat his views, I did not venture to oppose my judgment to his. What struck me particularly was that he saw the evil in men, not the good. Not once did he give man or woman credit for the possession of good qualities. All was mean, sordid, grasping, and selfish. He told me that we should have to walk four miles to his place of business. "'I enjoy walking,' he said, "'and the only riding I care for is on the top of an omnibus through squalid streets. You get peeps into garrets and one-room habitations. Gifted with the power of observation, you can see rare pictures there.' On our road I stopped at a post-office, and sent a telegram of three words to my wife. All is well. Our course lay in the direction of Westminster. We crossed the bridge, and turned down a narrow street. Chapel Street. Halfway down the street, Devlin paused and said, Behold our establishment. It was a poor and common house, and had it not been for a barber's pole sticking out from the doorway, and a fly-flown cardboard in the parlour window, on which was written, Barber and Hairdresser, All Styles, Lowest Charges. I should not have supposed that a trade was carried on therein. As we entered the passage, a woman came forward and handed Devlin a key. He thanked her, unlocked the parlour door, and we went in. The fittings in this room, which I saw at a glance was the shop in which the shaving and hairdressing were done, were entirely out of keeping with the poor tenement in which it was situated. The walls were lined with fine mirrors, there were three luxurious barber's chairs, the washstands were of marble, and the appliances for shampooing perfect. "'You would hardly expect it,' observed Devlin. "'I would not,' I replied. "'It is my idea,' he said. It rivals the West End establishments, and for skill I would challenge the world, if I were desirous of courting publicity. Then the charges. One-sixth those of true fit. I shave for a penny, cut for another penny, shampoo for another. But only those can be attended to who hold my tickets. I was compelled to adopt this plan, otherwise I should have been overwhelmed with customers. It enables me to choose them. When I see a likely man, one who is ripe, and in whom I discern possibilities which commend themselves to me, I say, Oblige me, sir, by accepting this ticket of admission, and having given him a taste of my skill, he comes again. I have quite a connection. He accompanied these last words with a strange smile. What part do you propose to assign to me in the business? I asked. A part to which you will not object. That of looker-on not from this room, but that, pointing to the back room. The panels of the door, you will observe, are of ground glass. Sitting within there, you can see all that passes in this room, without being yourself seen. If you will keep quiet, no one will suspect that you are in hiding. For the life of me, I said, I cannot guess what good my sitting in there will do. I do not suppose you can, but learn from me that I do nothing without a motive. I do not care to be questioned too closely. The promise I have made to you will be kept if you do not thwart it. You may see something that will surprise you. I say may, because I have not the power to entirely rule men's movements. But I think it almost certain he will pay me a visit this morning." He? I cried. Who? The man whose thoughts I read on Friday, with respect to the girl who was murdered on that night. I started. If Devlin spoke the truth, and if the man came to his shop this morning, I should be in possession of a practical clue which would lead me to the goal I wished to reach. He comes regularly, continued Devlin, on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. This is his day. Do you know his name? I inquired in great excitement. I did not, replied Devlin, the last time I saw him. How should I know it now? Nor where he lives? nor where he lives. I must obey you, I suppose, I said. It will be advisable, and you must obey me implicitly. Deviate by a hair's breadth from what I require of you, and I withdraw my promise, which now exists in full integrity. Decide. I have decided, 
I will remain in that room. There is another point upon which I must insist positively. From that room you do not stir until I bid you. In that room you do not speak unless you receive a cue from me. Agreed? Agreed. On your honour? On my honour. Good. Now you can retire. You will find books in there to amuse you if you get wearied with your watch. He opened the door for me, and closed it upon me. He had spoken correctly. Through the ground glass I could see everything in the shop, and I took his word for it that I could not myself be seen. Scarcely had a minute passed before a customer entered. Devlin, who, while he was arguing with me, had taken off his coat and put on a linen jacket of spotless white, behaved most decorously. His manner was deferential without being subservient, respectful without being familiar. The man was shaved by Devlin, and then his head was brushed by machinery, which I had forgotten to mention was fixed in the shop. There was a caressing motion about Devlin's shapely hands, which could not but be agreeable to those who sought his tonsorial aid, and his conversation, judging from the expression on his customer's face, must have been amusing and entertaining. The customer took his departure, and another, appearing as he went out, was duly attended to. This went on until eleven o'clock by my watch, and nothing had occurred of a special interest to me. Devlin was kept pretty busy, but although his time was fully employed, the business at such prices could not have been remunerative, especially when it was considered that the fitting up of the shop must have cost a pretty sum of money, and that the profits of the concern had to be divided between two persons, Mr. Lemon and himself. It was not till past eleven that my attention was more than ordinarily attracted by Devlin's behaviour the difference in which perhaps no one except myself would have particularly noticed. A man of the middle class entered and took his seat. He wore a beard and moustache, and although I could not hear what he said, he spoke in so low a tone, I judged correctly that he instructed Devlin to shave his face bare. Devlin proceeded to obey him, and clipped and cut, and finally applied his razor until not a vestige of hair was left on the man's face. That being done, Devlin cut this customer's hair close, and then used his brushes, and as his hands moved about the man's head there was, if I may so describe it, a feline, insinuating expression in them which aroused my curiosity. I thought of the singular dream I have described, and it appeared to me that all the while Devlin was employed over his customer, the brains of the man sitting so quietly in the chair were figuratively exposed to his view and that he was reading the thoughts which stirred therein. When the man was gone there was a peculiar smile upon Devlin's face, and I observed that he laughed quietly to himself. There happened to be no one in the shop to claim Devlin's attention, and I, who was impatiently waiting for some sign from Devlin, pertinent to the secret purpose to which both he and I were pledged, expected it to be given now. For the circumstance of the man having been shaved bare, which so altered his appearance that I should not otherwise have known that the person who entered the shop was the same person who left it, was to me so suspicious that in my anxiety and agitation I connected it with the murder of poor Lizzie Melladew, arguing that the man had effected this disguise in himself for the purpose of escaping detection. But Devlin made no sign, and did not even look towards the glass door. Other customers came in, Devlin was busy again twelve o'clock, half-past twelve, one o'clock, and still no indication of anything in connection with my task. With a feeling of intense disappointment, and beginning to doubt whether I had not allowed myself to be duped, I replaced my watch in my pocket, and had scarcely done so before my heart was beating violently at the appearance of a gentleman whom I little expected to see in Devlin's shop. This gentleman was no other than Mr. Kenneth Dowsett, George Carton's Guardian. End of chapter 23。Chapter 24 of Devlin the Barber by B. L. Fargin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The beating of my heart became normal. 
I suppose it was the sudden appearance of a gentleman with whose face I was familiar, after many hours of suspense, that had caused its pulsations to become so rapid and violent. There was nothing surprising, after all, in the presence of Mr. Dowsett in Devlin's shop. His address was in Westminster, Devlin was an exceptionally fine workman, the accommodation was luxurious, the charges low. Even I, in my position in life, would be tempted to deal occasionally with so expert and perfect a barber as Devlin, at the prices he charged. Then, why not Mr. Kenneth Dowsett? Besides, he might be of a frugal turn. Devlin was not long engaged over him. Mr. Dowsett was shaved. Mr. Dowsett had his hair brushed by machinery. Mr. Dowsett, moreover, was very particular as to the arrangement of his hair and Devlin, I saw, did his best to please him. But so deft and facile was Devlin that he did not dally with Mr. Dowsett for longer than five or six minutes. Mr. Dowsett rose, paid Devlin, exchanged a few smiling words with him, and, taking a final look at himself in the mirrors, turning himself this way and that, walked out of the shop. Evidently Mr. Dowsett was a very vain man. No sooner was he gone than Devlin locked the shop door from within whipped off his linen jacket, and opened the door of the room in which I was sitting. I came forward in no amiable mood. "'You are wearied with your long enforced rest,' said Devlin. "'I am wearied and disgusted,' I retorted. "'I expected a clue.' "'Have you not received it?' asked Devlin, smiling. "'Received it?' I echoed. "'How? Where?' "'You have seen my customers, and all that has passed between me and them. "'Well?' well he said mocking me is there not one among them upon whom your suspicions are fixed is there not one among them who could if he chose supply us with a starting point i say us because we are comrades fool fool that i was i exclaimed involuntarily raising my hand to my forehead why did i allow him to escape why did you let whom escape you asked devlin in a bantering tone the man whose beard and moustache you shaved off. He must have a reason, a vital reason, for effecting this disguise in himself. And I have let him slip through my fingers." "'He has a vital reason for so disguising himself,' said Devlin. "'But it has no connection with the murder of Lizzie Melladew.' "'Then what do you mean?' I cried, by asking me whether I have not received a clue. "'Was your attention attracted to no other of my customers than this man?' There was only one who was known to me, Mr. Kenneth Dowsett. Ah, said Devlin, Mr. Kenneth Dowsett. A light seemed to dawn suddenly upon me, but the suggestion conveyed in Devlin's significant tone so amazed me that I could not receive it unquestioningly. Do you mean to tell me, I cried, that you suspect Mr. Dowsett of complicity in this frightful murder? I mean to tell you nothing of my suspicions, replied Devlin. It is for you, not for me, to suspect. It is for you, not for me, to draw conclusions. What I know positively of Mr. Dowsett, with whose name I was unacquainted until last evening, when you mentioned it in Lemon's house, I will tell you, if you wish. Tell me, then. It is short but pregnant. Through Mr. Kenneth Dowsett's mind, as I shaved him and dressed his hair on Friday last, passed the picture of a beautiful girl, with golden hair, wearing a bunch of white daisies in her belt. Through his mind passed a picture of a lake of still water in Victoria Park. Through his mind passed a vision of blood. "'Are you a devil?' I exclaimed, "'that you did not step in to prevent the deed?' "'My dear sir,' he said, seizing my arm, which I had involuntarily raised, and holding it as a vice, "'you are unreasonable.' I have never in my life been in Victoria Park, which, I believe, covers a large space of ground. Why should I elect to pass an intensely uncomfortable night, wandering about paths in an unknown place, to interfere in I know not what? Even were I an interested party, it would be an act of folly, for such a proceeding would lay me open to suspicion. A nice task you would allot to me when you tacitly declare that it should be my mission to prevent the commission of human crime then how was I to gauge the precise value of Mr. Dowsett's thoughts? He might be a dramatist, inventing a sensational plot for a popular theatre. He might be an author of exciting fiction. 
Give over your absurdities and school yourself into calmer methods. Unless you do so, you will have small chance of unravelling this mystery. And consider, my dear sir, he added, making me a mocking bow, if I am a devil, how honoured you should be that I accept you as my comrade. The tone in which he spoke was calm and measured. Indeed, it had not escaped my observation that, whether he was inclined to be malignant or agreeable, insinuating or threatening, he never raised his voice above a certain pitch. I inwardly acknowledged the wisdom of his counsel that I should keep my passion in control, and I resolved from that moment to follow it. "'You locked the shop door,' I said, when Mr. Dowsett left you just now. "'I did,' was his response, thinking it would be your wish that I should do no more business to-day. "'Why should you think that?' "'Because of what was passing through Mr. Dowsett's mind.' I ask you to pardon me for my display of passion. What was Mr. Dowsett thinking of? Of two very simple matters, said Devlin, the time of day and an address. The time was fifteen minutes past three, the address, twenty-eight, Athelstan Road. Nothing more? I inquired, much puzzled. Nothing more. I pondered a moment. I could draw no immediate conclusion from material so bare. I asked Devlin what he could make of it. He replied, politely, that it was for me, not for him, to make what I could of it. A suggestion presented itself. At fifteen minutes past three, I said, Mr. Dowsett has an appointment with some person at twenty-eight Athelstan Road. Possibly, said Devlin. Have you a London directory? I have not. Nor, I imagine, will you easily find one in this neighbourhood. A simpler plan, I said, perhaps will be to go to Mr. Dowsett's house, to which he has most likely returned, and set watch there for him, keeping ourselves well out of sight. It is now twenty minutes past one. We can reach his house in ten minutes. He will hardly leave it for his appointment till two, or a little past. We will follow him secretly, and ascertain whom he is going to see, and his purpose. I am determined now to adopt bold measures. Behind this frightful mystery there is another, which shall be brought to light. You will accompany me? I am at your orders, said Devlin. We left the house together, and in the time I specified were within a few yards of Mr. Dowsett's residence. Aware of the importance of not attracting attention, I looked about for a means of escaping observation. Nearly opposite Mr. Dowsett's dwelling was a public house, in the first floor window of which I saw a placard, billiards, pool. I concluded that it was the window of a billiard-room, and without hesitation I entered the public-house, followed by Devlin, and mounted the stairs. The room, as I supposed, contained a billiard-table. The marker, a very pale and very thin youth, was practising the spot-stroke. "'Billiard, sir?' he asked as we entered. "'Yes,' I said. "'We wish to play a private game. How much an hour?' Eighteen pence.' Here are five shillings, I said, for a couple of hours. We shall not want you to mark. Don't let us be disturbed. The pale thin youth took the money, laid down his cue, and left us to ourselves. When he was gone, I placed a chair at an angle against the handle of the door, there being no key in the lock, and thus prevented the entrance of any person without notice. It was the leisure time of the day, and there was little fear of our being disturbed. The extra gratuity I had given to the marker would ensure privacy. As I took my station at the window, from which Mr. Dowsett's house was in full view, Devlin nodded approval of my proceedings. "'You are a man of resource,' he said. "'I perceive that you intend henceforth to act sensibly.' Minute after minute passed, and there was no sign of any person leaving or entering Mr. Dowsett's house. Every now and then I consulted my watch. Two o'clock a quarter past two, half past. I began to grow impatient, but, to please Devlin, did not exhibit it. Perfect silence reigned between us. We exchanged not a word. Time waned, and now I more frequently looked at my watch, the hands of which were drawing on to three. They reached the hour and passed it. A quarter past three. Perplexed and disappointed, I debated on my next move. I soon decided what it should be. I had promised Richard Carton that I would call upon him. I would do so now. 
If Mr. Dowsett was at home, all the better. I made Devlin acquainted with my resolve, and he said, Very good. I will go with you. Removing the chair I had placed against the handle of the door, we went from the public house and crossed the road. I knocked at Mr. Dowsett's door, and a maid servant answered the summons. Does Mr. Kenneth Dowsett live here? Yes, sir. Is he at home? No, sir. Is Mr. Richard Carton in? Yes, sir. Give him my card, and say I wish to see him. Will you please walk this way, sir? said the maid servant. She ushered us into the dining-room, where she left us alone while she went to apprise Richard Carton of my visit. The room was exceedingly well furnished. Good pictures were on the walls, and there was a tasteful arrangement of bric-a-brac and bronzes. I had no time for further observation, the entrance of Richard Carton claiming my attention. "'Ah!' he exclaimed, "'you have come. I was beginning to be afraid you would disappoint me.' "'You delivered my letter to my wife?' I asked. "'Yes, and the desk. My guardian wanted to persuade me to leave it till this morning, but I would not.' "'You were quite right.' He looked towards Devlin. "'A friend,' I said, waving my hand as a kind of introduction, "'who may be of assistance to us.' "'But introduce us plainly,' expostulated Devlin. "'Mr. Devlin,' I said, "'Mr. Richard Carton.' They shook hands, and then Carton inquired whether I had anything to tell him. "'Nothing tangible,' I replied, "'but we are on the road.' "'Yes,' repeated Devlin, "'we are on the road.' "'Excuse me for asking,' said Carton to Devlin, "'but are you a detective?' "'In a spiritual way,' said Devlin. Carton's mind was too deeply occupied with the one supreme subject of the murder to ask for an explanation of this enigmatical reply. He turned towards me. "'Is your guardian in?' I inquired. "'No,' said Carton. "'What should I say next?' It would have been folly to make Richard Carton a participant in the strange revelations which were directing my proceedings. "'Can you tell me,' I asked, "'where Athelstan Road is?' "'It is in Margate,' he replied, in a tone of surprise, "'and the number is twenty-eight. It was my turn now to exhibit surprise. "'Number twenty-eight! I exclaimed. "'Who lives there?' "'I don't know. Mrs. Dowsett and Letitia went to Margate by an early train on Saturday morning, before I was awake, and my guardian has gone there to see them. I should have proposed to go with him, had it not been for my determination not to leave London till this dreadful mystery was cleared up. And then there was the promise you made me give you last night, that I should remain here all the day till you came to see me. "'When did your guardian go to Margate?' I asked. He has gone from Victoria, replied Carton, glancing at a marble clock on the mantelshelf, by the Granville train. It starts at fifteen minutes past three. I also glanced at the clock. It was just half past three, a quarter of an hour past the time. End of chapter twenty four. Chapter twenty five of Devlin the Barber by B. L. Fargin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Carton, noticing my discomposure, inquired if there was anything wrong. I answered yes. I was afraid there was something very wrong. In connection with the fate of my poor girl? he asked. Yes, I replied. In connection with her fate. Good heavens! he cried. You surely do not suspect that my guardian is mixed up with it? I am of the opinion, I answered guardedly, that he may be able to throw some light on it. Mr. Carton, ask me no further questions, or you may seriously hamper me. Have you a timetable in the house? No? Then we must obtain one immediately. It is my purpose to follow your guardian to Margate by the quickest and earliest train. I give you five minutes to get ready greatly excited he darted from the room and in half the time i had named returned with a small bag into which he had thrust a few articles of clothing during his absence i said to devlin you will accompany us my dear sir he replied i will go with you to the ends of the earth i shall greatly enjoy this pursuit the vigour and spirit you are putting into it are worthy of the highest admiration 
we three went out together and at the first bookshop i purchased an a b c and ascertained that the next best train to margate was the five fifteen from victoria which was timed to arrive at seven thirty one calculating that it would be a few minutes late we could no doubt reach athelstan road at half past eight i had time to run home to my wife and embrace her and my children it was necessary also that i should furnish myself with funds there being very little money in my purse and i determined to use the one hundred pounds which mr portland had left with me employed as i was the use of this money was justifiable hailing a hansom we jumped into it carton sitting on devlin's knee and we soon reached my house in as few words as possible i explained to my wife all that was necessary kissed her and the children took possession of the hundred pounds and of a light bag in which my wife had put a change of clothing left a private message for mr portland and rejoined devlin and carton who were waiting for me in the hansom i asked my wife but two questions the first how mr and mrs melladew were the second whether anything had been heard of the missing daughter mary she told me that the unhappy parents were completely prostrated by the blow and that no news whatever had been heard of mary we arrived at victoria station in good time and by the aid of a judicious tip i secured a first-class compartment into which the guard assured me no one should be admitted i had a distinct reason for desiring this privacy there were subjects upon which i wished to talk with richard carton and i could not carry on the conversation in the presence of strangers i said nothing to him of this in the cab the noise of the wheels making conversation difficult we should be two hours and a half getting to margate and on the journey i could obtain all the information i desired we started promptly to the minute and then i requested carton to give me his best attention he and i sat next to each other devlin sitting in the opposite corner he threw himself back and closed his eyes but i knew that he heard every word that passed between me and carton i am going to ask you a series of questions i said to the young man not one of which shall be asked from idle curiosity answer me as directly to the point as you can explain how it is that mr kenneth dowsett is your guardian i lost both my parents replied carton when i was very young of my mother i have no remembrance whatever of my father but little he and mr dowsett were upon the most intimate terms of friendship my father had such confidence in him that when he drew his will he named mr dowsett as his executor and my guardian i was to live with him and his wife and he was to see to my education he has faithfully fulfilled the trust my father reposed in him did your father leave a large fortune roughly speaking i am worth two thousand pounds a year mr dowsett having to receive you in his house as a son and to look after your education doubtless was in receipt of a fair consideration for his services oh yes until i was twenty-one years of age he was to draw six hundred pounds a year out of the funds invested for me the balance accumulated for my benefit until i came of age he drew this money regularly yes as he was entitled to do how old are you now twenty-four you are living still with mr dowsett and you still regard him as your guardian i have a great affection for him he has treated me most kindly what do you pay him for your board and lodging he continues to receive the six hundred a year it is all he has to depend on was this last arrangement of his own proposing or yours of mine i cannot sufficiently repay him for his care of me in your father's will what was to become of your fortune in the event of your death if i died before i came of age my guardian was to have the six hundred a year and the rest was to be given to various charities and after you came of age it was mine absolutely to do as i pleased with have you made a will yes who proposed that my guardian what are the terms of this will i have left everything to him i have no relatives and no other claims upon me when i came to see you this afternoon you mentioned a name which was new to me 
You said that your guardian had gone to Margate with his wife and Letitia. I supposed he was married, and your speaking of Mrs. Dowsett did not surprise me. But who is Letitia? Their daughter. An only child? Yes. What is her age? Twenty-two. Has she a sweetheart? Is she engaged to be married? No. That answer seems to me to be given with constraint. Well, said Carton, it is hardly right, is it, to go so minutely into my guardian's private family affairs? It is entirely right. I am engaged upon a very solemn task, and I can see, probably, what is hidden from you. Why were you partly disinclined to answer my last question? It is a little awkward, replied Carton, because, perhaps, I am not quite free from blame. Explain your meaning. Believe me, this may be more serious than you imagine. Speak frankly. I am acting, indeed, as your true friend. Yet, after all, said Carton, with hesitation, I never made love to her. I give you my honour. Made love to whom? Miss Dowsett? Yes. The fact is, they looked upon it as a settled thing that I was to marry Letitia. I did not know it at the time. No though we were living in the same house for so many years, I never suspected it. I always looked upon Letitia as a sister, and I behaved affectionately towards her. They must have put a wrong construction upon it. When they discovered that I was in love with my poor Lizzie, Mr. Dowsett said to me, It will break Letitia's heart. Then I began to understand, and I assure you I felt remorseful. Letitia did not say anything to me, but I could see by her looks how deeply she was wounded. Once my guardian made the remark that if I had not met the young lady, meaning Lizzie, his most joyful hope would have been realized, meaning by that that when I saw that Letitia loved me I might have grown to love her, and we should have been married. I said, I remember, that it might have been, for he seemed to expect something like that from me, and I said it to console him, but it was not true. I could never have loved Letitia, except as a sister. Did your guardian know the name of the poor girl you have lost? Oh, yes. He met us first when we were walking together, and I introduced him. We had almost a quarrel, my guardian and I, some time afterwards. He said that Miss Melladew was beneath me, and that it would be better if I married in my own station in life. I was hurt and angry, and I begged him to retract his words beneath me. She was as far above me as the highest lady in the land could have been. She was the best, the brightest, the purest girl in the world. And I have lost her. I have lost her. What hope is there left to me now? He covered his face with his hands, and I waited till he was calm before I spoke again. In my hearing, I then said, you have twice made a remark which struck me as strange. It was to the effect that you would not allow your guardian to give you any more opiates. He gave me one last Friday night before I went to bed, on the night my poor Lizzie was killed. I was excited, because I think I told you, sir, that it was decided between Lizzie and me that I should go to her father's house on Sunday to ask permission to pay my addresses openly to her. Till then I was not to see her again, and that made me restless. My guardian was anxious about me, though he did not know the cause of my restlessness and excitement. To please him, I took the opiate, and slept soundly till late in the morning. And when I awoke, sir, when I awoke and went out to buy a present for Lizzie, which I intended to take to Lizzie on Sunday, almost the first thing I heard... He quite broke down here, and a considerable time elapsed before he was sufficiently recovered to continue the conversation. Supposing, I said, that this dreadful event had not occurred, and that you and poor Lizzie had been happily married, would you have continued to give your guardian the income he had enjoyed so long? I do not know. I cannot say. Perhaps not, although I never considered the question. But on the day that I left his house for the home I dreamt and hoped would be mine, the home in which Lizzie and I would have lived happily together, I should have given him something handsome and I am sure I should always have been his friend. 
I ought not, perhaps, now that we have gone so far, to conceal anything from you. Indeed you ought not. Tell me everything. It may help me. I am sure, said the young fellow, with deep feeling, that he did not mean it, and that he said it only to comfort me. But it made me mad. He hinted that my poor Lizzie could not have been true to me, that she must have had another lover, whom she was in the habit of meeting late at night. If any other man had dared to say as much, I would have killed him. But my guardian meant no harm, and when he saw how he had wounded me, he begged my pardon humbly. I am sure, I am sure he repented that he had breathed a suspicion against my poor girl. Pardon me, I said, for asking you a question which, in any other circumstances, would not cross my lips but it will be as well for me to put it to you. You yourself had no appointment with her on that night. No! cried Carton indignantly. As heaven is my judge! I never met her, I never proposed to meet her, at such an hour. I am certain of it. And yet, receive this calmly, if you can, and yet, she must have gone out late on that night, for some purpose or other. There is the mystery said Carton mournfully, and I have thought and thought about it without being able to find a key to it. There must have been a trap set for her, a devilish trap to ensnare her. I think so myself. Otherwise it is not likely she would have left her home, as she must have done, secretly. Now a word or two about Mrs. Dowsett and Letitia. When you woke up on Saturday morning, you found that they had gone to Margate? Yes. Did you know on the day before that they were going? No, nothing was said about it. It was quite sudden. Was Mrs. Dowsett or her daughter ill? Did they go into the country for their health? Not to my knowledge. Were they in the habit of going away suddenly? Oh, no, they had never done so before. What explanation did your guardian give? He said that Letitia had been suffering in secret for some time, and that her mother thought a change would do her good. Did he tell you where they had gone to? No, he did not mention the place. I learnt it from one of the servants. So that afterwards he was forced to be frank with you? I don't understand you. Reflect. When you rose on Saturday morning you found that Mrs. Dowsett and her daughter had gone away suddenly. You knew nothing at that moment of poor Lizzie's death, and therefore had nothing to trouble you. Did it not strike you as strange that your guardian did not mention the part of the country they had gone to? Or if, your mind being greatly occupied with the arranged interview with Mr. and Mrs. Melladew on the following day, you did not then think it strange that your guardian said nothing of Margate? Do you not think so now? Yes, answered Carton thoughtfully. I do think so now. How did you learn that Mrs. Dowsett was stopping at 28 Athelstan Road? By accident. My guardian opened a letter this morning, and a piece of paper dropped from it. I picked it up, and as I gave it to him, I saw 28 Athelstan Road written on it. Is that where Mrs. Dowsett and Letitia are stopping? I asked, and he answered, yes. So that it was not directly through him that you learnt the address? No but I don't see that it is of any importance. It was not my cue to enter into an argument, therefore I did not reply to his remark. I had gained from Carton information which, lightly as he regarded it, I deemed of the highest importance. There was, however, still something more which I desired to speak of, but which I scarcely knew how to approach. After a little reflection I made a bold plunge. Is your fortune under your own control? Yes. Do you keep a large balance at your bank? Pretty fair, but just now it does not amount to much. Still, if you want any... I do not want any. Am I right in conjecturing that there is a special reason for your balance being small just now? There is a special reason. On Saturday morning, before I left home, I drew a large cheque which you gave to your guardian. "'How do you know that?' asked Carton, in a tone of surprise. "'It was just a guess. What was the amount of the cheque?' Two thousand pounds. "'Payable to order or bearer?' "'To bearer. 
it was for two investments which mr dowsett recommended that was the reason for the cheque being made payable to bearer to enable my guardian to pay it to two different firms he said both the investments would turn out splendidly but it matters very little to me now whether they do or not all the money in the world will not bring happiness to me now that my poor lizzie is dead do you know whether your guardian cashed the cheque i do not i haven't asked him anything about it i could think only of one thing i can well imagine it thank you for answering my questions so clearly by and by you may know why i asked them these words had hardly passed my lips before devlin carton and i were thrown violently against each other the shock was great but fortunately we were not hurt screams of pain from adjoining carriages proclaimed that this was not the case with other passengers the train was dragged with erratic force for a considerable distance and then came to a sudden standstill we had best get out said devlin who was the first to recover we followed the sensible advice and upon emerging from the carriage discovered that other carriages were overturned and that the line was blocked happily despite the screams of the frightened passengers the injuries they had met with were slight and when all were safely got out we stood along the line gazing helplessly at each other devlin however was an exception he was the only perfectly composed person amongst us it is unfortunate he said with a certain maliciousness in his voice we are not half-way to margate the best laid schemes are liable to come to grief if mr kenneth dowsett knew of this he would rejoice it was with intense anxiety that i made inquiries of the guard whether the accident would delay us long the guard answered that he could not say yet but that to all appearance we should be delayed two or three hours i received this information with dismay it would upon that calculation be midnight before we reached our destination i considered time so precious that i would have given every shilling in my pocket to have been at that moment in margate take it philosophically said devlin at my elbow and be thankful that your bones are not broken it will but prolong the hunt which i promise you shall in the end be successful i looked at him almost gratefully for this speculative crumb of comfort and there was real humour in the smile with which he met my gaze behold me in another character he said devlin the consoler but you have laid me under an obligation my dear sir which i am endeavouring to repay your conversation with that unhappy young man pointing to carton who stood at a little distance from us was truly interesting you have mistaken your vocation you would have made a first-class detective to add to the discomfiture of the situation it began to rain heavily i felt it would be foolish and a waste of power to fret and fume and i therefore endeavoured to profit by devlin's advice to take it philosophically a number of men were now at work setting things straight they worked with a will but the guard's prognostication proved correct it was nearly eleven o'clock before we started again and past midnight when we arrived at margate it was pitch dark and the furious wind drove the pelting rain into our faces a wild night at sea cried devlin with a kind of exultation in his voice though this may have been my fancy he had to speak very loud to make himself heard you can do nothing till the morning and very little then if the storm lasts do you know margate at all no i shouted despondently do you asked devlin addressing carton i've never been here before replied carton there's a decent hotel not far off said devlin the nayland rock we'll knock them up and get beds there cling tight to me if you don't want your bones broken steady now steady we had to cling tightly to him for we could not see a yard before us devlin pulled us along singing some strange wild song at the top of his voice we were a long time making those in the hotel hear us but the door was opened at last and we were admitted there was only one vacant room in the hotel but fortunately it contained two beds 
To this room we were conducted, and then came the question of settling three persons in the two beds. Devlin solved the difficulty by pulling the counterpanes off, and extending himself full length upon the floor. "'This will do for me,' he said, wrapping himself up in the counterpanes. "'I've had worse accommodations in my travels through the world. I've slept in the bush, with the sky for a roof. I've slept in the hollow of a tree, with wild beasts howling round me. I've slept on billiard-tables and under them, with a thousand rats running over me, and a score of other wanderers. Good night, comrades!' Anxiety did not keep me awake. I was tired out, and slept well. When we arose in the morning, all signs of the storm had fled. The sun was shining brightly, and a soft, warm air flowed through the open window. End of chapter 25 Chapter 26 of Devlin the Barber by B. L. Fargen This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The first thing to be done, after partaking of a hurried breakfast, was to arrange our programme. Carton suggested that we should all go together to Athelstan Road to see his guardian, and I had some difficulty in prevailing upon him to forego this plan. We spoke together quite openly in the presence of Devlin, who, for the most part, contented himself with listening to the discussion. Evidently, said Carton, you have suspicions against my guardian, and it is only fair that he should be made acquainted with them. He shall be made acquainted with them, I replied, but it must be in the way and at the time I deem best. I hold you to your promise to be guided by me. Carton nodded discontentedly. I am to stop here and do nothing, I suppose, he said. That is how you will best assist me, I said. If you are seen at present by Mr. Dowsett, you will ruin everything. You shall not, however, be quite idle. Have you your cheque-book with you? Yes, he said, producing it. Let me look at the block of the cheque for the two thousand pounds you drew on Saturday morning, payable to bearer, and gave to Mr. Dowsett. It is the last cheque I drew, said Carton, handing me the book. I glanced at it, saw that the bank was the National Provincial Bank of England, and the number of the cheque was 134178. Then I obtained a telegraph form, and at my instruction Carton wrote the following telegram. To the manager, National Provincial Bank of England, 112 Bishopsgate Street, London. Has my cheque for two thousand pounds, number 184178, drawn by me on Saturday, and made payable to bearer, been cashed, and how was it paid, in notes or gold? Reply paid. Urgent. Waiting here for answer. From Richard Carton, Nayland Rock Hotel, Margate. I will take this myself to the telegraph office, I said, and you will wait here for the answer. I will be back as quickly as possible, but it is likely I may be absent for an hour or more. With that I left him, Devlin accompanying me at my request. I could have sent the telegram from the railway station, but I chose to send it from the local post office, for the reason that I expected to receive there a telegram from my wife, whom I had instructed to wire to me, before eight o'clock, whether there was anything fresh in the London newspapers concerning the murder of Lizzie Melladew. I mentioned this to Devlin, and he said, "'You omit nothing. It is a pleasure to work with you. Command me in any way you please. My turn, perhaps, will come by and by.' It was early morning, and our way lay along the marine parade, every house in which was either a public or a boarding-house. From every basement in the row, as we walked on, ascended one uniform odour of the cooking of bacon and eggs, which caused Devlin to humorously remark that when bacon and eggs ceased to be the breakfast of the average Englishman, the decay of England's greatness would commence. All along the line this familiar odour accompanied us. At the post-office I found my wife's telegram awaiting me. It was to the effect that there was nothing new in the papers concerning the murder. The criminal was still at large, and the police appeared to have failed in obtaining a clue. I dispatched Carton's telegram to the London Bank, and then we proceeded to Athelstan Road, and soon found the house we were in search of. 
I had decided upon my plan of operations. Devlin was not to appear. He was to stand at some distance from the house, and only to come forward if I called him. I was to knock and inquire for Mr. Dowsett, and explain to him that, not feeling well, I had run down to Margate for the day. Carton had given me his guardian's address, and had asked me to inquire whether Mr. Dowsett would be absent from London for any length of time, intending, if such was the case, to join Mr. Dowsett and his family in the country. Then I was to trust to chance and to anything I observed how next to proceed. The whole invention was as lame as well could be, but I could not think of a better. It was only when decided action was necessary that I felt how powerless I was. All that I had to depend upon was a slender and mysterious thread of conjecture. I knocked at the door, and of the servant who opened it I inquired if Mr. Dowsett was up yet. "'Oh, yes, sir,' replied the girl. "'Up and gone, all of them. "'Up and gone, all of them!' I exclaimed. "'Yes, sir. Had breakfast at half-past six, and went away directly afterwards.' "'Do you know where to?' "'No, sir. Oh, here's Mrs.' The landlady came forward. "'Do you want rooms, sir?' "'Not at present. I came to see Mr. Dowsett. "'Gone away, sir, him and the three ladies.' "'So your servant informed me. But I thought I should be certain to find him here. "'Stop. What did you say? Mr. Dowsett and the three ladies? You mean the two ladies?' "'I mean three, said the landlady, looking sharply at me. "'They only came on Saturday. Mr. Dowsett came yesterday. "'You must excuse me, sir. There's the dining-room bell and the drawing-room bell ringing all together.' "'A moment, I beg,' I said, slipping half a crown into her hand. "'Do you know where they have gone to?' "'No, they didn't tell me. They were in a hurry to catch a train. But I don't know what train, and don't know where to.' Her manner proclaimed that she not only did not know, but did not care. "'They had some boxes with them?' I said. "'Yes, two. I can't wait another minute. I never did see such a impatient gentleman as the dining-rooms.' "'Only one more question,' I said, forcibly detaining her. "'Did they drive to the station?' "'Yes, they had a carriage. Please let me go, sir.' "'Do you know the man who drove them? Do you know the number of the carriage?' "'Haven't the slightest idea,' said the landlady, and, freeing herself from my grasp, she ran down to the kitchen. I stepped into the street with a feeling of mortification. Mr. Kenneth Dowsett had given me the slip again. Rejoining Devlin, I related to him what had passed. "'What are you going to do next?' he asked. "'I am puzzled,' I replied, and hardly know what to do.' "'That is not like you,' said Devlin. Come, I will assist you. Mr. Kenneth Dowsett seems to be in a hurry. The more reason for spirit and increased vigilance on our part. Observe, I say our part. I am growing interested in this case, and am curious to see the end of it. If Mr. Dowsett has gone back to London, we must follow him there. If he has gone to some other place, we must follow him to some other place. But how to find that out? He was driven to the station in a carriage. We must get hold of the driver. At present we are ignorant whether he has gone by the South Eastern or the London Chatham and Dover. We will go and inquire at the cab ranks. But although we spent fully an hour and a half in asking questions of every driver of a carriage we saw, we could ascertain no news of the carriage which had driven Mr. Dowsett and his family from Athelstan Road. I was in despair, and was about to give up the search and return disconsolately to the Nayland Rock, when a barefooted boy ran up to me, and asked whether I wasn't looking for the cove what drove a party from Athelstan Road. Yes, I said excitedly. Do you know him? Oh, I knows him, said the boy. Bill Foster he is. I helped him with the boxes. There was one little box the gent wouldn't let me touch. There was something heavy in it, and the gent give me a copper. Thank yer, sir. He was about to scuttle off with the sixpence I gave him, when I seized him, not by the collar, because he had none on, but by the neck where the collar should have been. Not so fast. There's half a crown more for you if you take me to Bill Foster at once. Can't do that, sir. Don't know where he is, but I'll find him for you. Very good. 
How many persons went away in Bill Foster's carriage? There was the gent and one, two, three women, two young uns and a old un. You're quite sure? I'll take my oath on it. Now look here. Do you see these five shillings? They're yours if you bring Bill Foster to me at the Nayland Rock in less than half an hour. You ain't kidding, sir? Not at all. The money's yours if you do what I tell you. All right, sir. I'll do it. And tell Bill Foster there's half a sovereign waiting for him at the Nayland Rock, but he mustn't lose a minute. With an intelligent nod the boy scampered off, and we made our way quickly back to the hotel, where Richard Carton was impatiently waiting us. "'Did you see him?' he asked eagerly. "'No,' I replied. "'He went away early this morning.' "'Where to?' "'I hope to learn that presently. Have you received an answer to your telegram?' "'No, not yet. There's the telegraph, messenger.' The lad was mounting the steps of the hotel. We followed him, and obtained the buff-coloured envelope addressed to Richard Carton, Nayland Rock Hotel, Margate, which he delivered to a waiter. Carton tore open the envelope, read the message, and handed it to me. The information it contained was that cheque 134178, for two thousand pounds, signed by Richard Carton, was cashed across the counter on Saturday morning, that the gentleman who presented it demanded that it should be paid in gold, that as this was a large amount to be so paid, the cashier had asked the gentleman to sign his name at the back of the cheque, notwithstanding that it was payable to bearer, and that the signature was that of Kenneth Dowsett. "'Do you think there's anything strange in that?' I asked. "'It does seem strange,' replied Carton thoughtfully. I made a rapid mental calculation, and said, two thousand sovereigns in gold weigh forty pounds, a heavy weight for a man to carry away with him. Carton did not reply, but I saw that, for the first time, his suspicions were aroused. "'You told me,' I continued, "'that Mrs. Dowsett and her daughter Letitia went away from their house on Saturday morning early.' "'So my guardian informed me. Was any other lady stopping with them?' "'I did not understand so from my guardian. Did they have any particular lady friend whom, for some reason or other, they wished to take with them to the seaside?' not to my knowledge. You can think of no one? Indeed, I cannot. It is your belief that only two ladies left the house? Yes, it is my belief. But, I said, Mrs. Dowsett took not only her daughter Letitia with her, but another lady, a young lady as well, and the three, in company with your guardian, left Margate suddenly this morning. I have ascertained this positively. Now, who is this young lady of whom you have no knowledge?" He passed his hand across his forehead, and gazed at me with a dawning terror in his eyes. "'Shall I tell you what is in my mind?' "'Yes.' "'If,' I said, speaking slowly and impressively, "'the theory I have formed is correct, and I believe it is. The young lady is Mary Melladew, poor Lizzie's sister.' "'Good God!' cried Carton. What makes you think that? End of chapter 26 Chapter 27 of Devlin the Barber by B. L. Fargen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It would occupy too long a time, I replied, to make my theory thoroughly comprehensible to you. Besides, I added, glancing at Devlin, it is a theory strangely born and strangely built up, and, in all likelihood, you would reject the most important parts of it as incredible and impossible. Therefore, we will not waste time in explaining or discussing it. Sufficient for us if we succeed in tracing this dreadful mystery to its roots and in bringing the murderer to justice. If I do not mistake, here comes the man I am waiting for. It was, indeed, Bill Foster, pioneered by the sharp lad who had engaged to find him. "'Here he is, sir,' said the boy, holding out his hand, half eagerly, half doubtfully. "'Your name is Foster,' I said, addressing the man. "'That's me,' said Foster. "'You drove a party from Athelstan Road early this morning?' "'Yes.' 
I counted five shillings into the boy's outstretched hand, and he scampered away in great delight. "'There's half a sovereign for you,' I said to Bill Foster, "'if you answer correctly a few questions. "'About the party I drove from Athelstan Road?' he asked. "'My questions will refer to them. You seem to hesitate.' "'The fact is,' said Bill Foster, "'the gentleman gave me a florin over my fare to keep my mouth shut. "'Only a fifth of what I offer you,' I said. "'Make it a sovereign,' suggested Devlin. "'I've no objection,' I said. "'All right,' said Bill Foster. "'Fire away. "'The gentleman bribed you to keep silence respecting his movements?' I asked. "'It must have been for that,' replied Bill Foster. "'Proving,' I observed, that he must have had some strong reason for secrecy. "'That's got nothing to do with me,' remarked Bill Foster. "'Of course not. What you've got to do is to earn the sovereign. Who engaged you for the job?' "'The gentleman himself. I wasn't out with my trap so early, and someone must have told him where I live. Anyways, he comes at a quarter past six, and knocks me up and says there's a good job waiting for me at 28 Athelstan Road, if I'd come at once. I says, all right, and I puts my horse to, and drives there. I got to the house at ten minutes to seven, and I drives the party to the London, Chatham, and Dover. How many were in the party? Four. The gentleman, a middle-aged lady, and two young uns. About what ages were the young ladies? Can't quite say. They wore veils, but I should reckon from eighteen to twenty-two. That's near enough. What luggage was there? Two trunks, a small box, and some other little things they took care of themselves. You had charge of the two trunks? Yes. And of the small box? Oh, no. The gentleman wouldn't let it out of his hands. I offered to help him with it, but he wouldn't let me touch it. That surprised you? Well, yes, because it was uncommon heavy. If it was filled with gold, he couldn't have been more careful of it. Perhaps it was, I said, turning slightly to Richard Carton. It was heavy enough. Why, he could hardly carry it. Did either of the ladies appear anxious about it? Yes, the middle-aged one. When I saw them so particular, I said, said I, to myself, you know, I shouldn't mind having that myself. When the gentleman told you to drive to the London, Chatham, and Dover station, did he say what train he wished to catch? No, but I found out the train they went by. It was the down train for Ramsgate, 731. They reached the station some time before it started? Yes, twenty minutes before. After the gentleman took his tickets, he came from the platform two or three times and looked at me. What are you waiting for? he asked the last time. For a fare, I answered. Look here, he said. If anybody asks you any questions about me, don't answer them. Why shouldn't I? I asked. It was then he pulled out the floor in. Oh, very well, I said. It's no business of mine. But I didn't go away till the train started with them in it. Do you know whether they intended to stop in Margate? I should say not. As I drove him to the station, I heard the gentleman speak to the middle-aged lady, his wife, I suppose, about the boat for Bologna. I gave a start of vexation. Devlin smiled. Carton was following the conversation with great attention. Do you know what boat? The Sir Walter Raleigh. The gentleman had one of the bills in his hand and was looking at it. He said to the lady, We shall be in plenty of time. Do you know at what time the boat starts from Ramsgate for Boulogne? Leaves the harbour at half-past nine, but is generally half an hour late. I looked at my watch. It was just eleven o'clock. Is there any chance, I asked, of this boat being delayed? Why should it? The weather's fair. Is there any other boat starting for Bologna this morning? None. There's the Sir Walter Raleigh from Ramsgate, and sometimes the India from here. But the India don't go to-day. Could we hire a boat from here? You might. It would be risky, and would cost a lot of money. Then there's no saying when you would get there. It's a matter of between forty and fifty miles, and the steamers take about five hours getting across. Sometimes a little less, sometimes a little more. There's no depending upon em. Look here. You're going to behave to me liberal. You want to follow the party I drove from Athistan this morning. Show me the way to get to Bologna today, I said, 
and I'll give you another half-sovereign. Practical creature, murmured Devlin. In human beings there is but one true touchstone. Spoke like a real gentleman, said Bill Foster to me. What time is it? Five minutes past eleven. Wait here. I shan't be gone but a few minutes. Get everything ready to start directly I come back. His trap was standing at the corner of Royal Crescent. He ran out, jumped on the box, and was gone. I called to the waiter, and in three minutes the hotel bill was paid, and we were ready. During Bill Foster's absence I said to Carton, "'Do you make anything of all this?' "'It looks,' replied Carton, "'as if my guardian was running away.' "'To my mind there's not a doubt of it. Have you any idea what that little box he would not let out of his charge contains?' The two thousand sovereigns he obtained from the bank, said Carton, in a tone of inquiry. Exactly. I tell you now plainly that I am positive Mr. Kenneth Dowsett is implicated in the murder of your poor girl. Carton set his teeth in great agitation. If he is, if he is, he said, but he could say no more. Bill Foster was back. There's a train to Folkestone, he cried, the southeastern line at eleven forty-seven. You can catch it easily. If there's no boat handy from Folkestone to Bologna, you'll be able to hire one there. The steamers take two hours going across. You can get there in four. Train arrives at Folkestone at one twenty-seven. By six o'clock you can be in Bologna. Jump into my trap, gentlemen." We jumped in and were driven to the station. His information was correct. I gave him thirty shillings, and he departed in high glee. Then we took tickets for Folkestone, and arrived there at a quarter to two. There was no steamer going, but with little difficulty we arranged to get across. The passage took longer than four hours, it took six. At nine o'clock at night we were in Bologna. I cannot speak an intelligible sentence in French. Carton was too agitated to take the direction of affairs. "'Do you know where we can stop?' I asked of Devlin. "'Have you ever been here before?' "'My dear sir,' said Devlin, "'I have travelled all over the world, and I know Bologna by heart. There's a little out-of-the-way hotel, the Hôtel de Poilly, in Rue de l'Amiral Bruix, that will suit us as though it were built for us.' "'Let us get there at once,' I said. He called a fly, and in a very short time we entered the courtyard of the Hôtel de Poilly. There we made arrangements with the jolly, comfortable-looking landlady, and then I looked at Carton, and he looked at me. The helplessness of our situation struck us both forcibly. "'Who is in command?' asked Devlin suddenly. "'You,' I replied, as by an inspiration. "'Good,' said Devlin. "'I accept the office. From this moment you are under my orders. Remain you here. I go to reconnoitre.' "'You will return?' I said. "'My dear sir,' said Devlin airily, it is too late now to doubt my integrity. I will return. For God's sake, said Carton, when Devlin was gone, who is this man who seems to divine everything, to know everything, and whom nothing disturbs? Sometimes when he looks at me I feel that he is exercising over me a terrible fascination. I cannot answer you, I said. Be satisfied with the knowledge that it is through him we have so far succeeded, and that, in my belief, it will be through him that the murderer will be tracked down. The world is full of mysteries, and that man is not the least of them." It wanted an hour to midnight when Devlin returned. In his inscrutable face I read no sign of success or failure, but the first words he spoke afforded me infinite relief. "'I have seen him,' he said. "'Let us go out and talk. Walls have ears.' The river Liang was but a short distance from the hotel and we strolled along the bank in silence, Devlin, contrary to my expectation, not uttering a word for many minutes. He had lit a cigar, and Carton had accepted one from him. I refused to smoke, having too vivid a remembrance of the cigar I had smoked in Fanny Lemon's house, and its effect upon me. At length Devlin said to Carton, "'You appear sleepy.' "'I am,' said the young man. "'You had best go to bed,' said Devlin. "'Nothing can be done to-night.' Carton, assenting, would have returned to the hotel alone, saying he could find the way, but I insisted that we should accompany him thither. 
I had heard that Boulogne was not the safest place in the world for strangers on a dark night. Having seen Carton to his room, we returned to the river's bank. Had Carton been in possession of his full senses, he would doubtless have objected, but he was dead asleep when he entered his bedroom, Devlin's cigar having affected him as the one I smoked had affected me. "'He encumbers us,' said Devlin, looking out upon the dark river. "'I have discovered where Mr. Dowsett is lodging, and were our young friend informed of the address, he might rush there and spoil all. We happen to be in luck, if you believe in such a quality as luck. I do not, but I use the term out of a compliment to you. Mr. Dowsett's quarters are in the locality of the Rue de la Paix, and, singularly enough, are situated over a barber's shop. Things go in runs, do they not? Nothing but barbers. I do not return with you to the hotel to-night. What do you mean? I asked, startled by this information. The proprietor of the barber's shop over which Mr. Kenneth Dowsett is sleeping, but, perhaps not sleeping, for a sword is hanging above his head, and he may be gazing at the phantom in terror, say, then, over which he is lying, is an agreeable person. I have struck up an acquaintance with him, and, by arrangement, shall be in his saloon to-morrow, to attend to any persons who may present themselves. Mr. Dowsett will probably need the razor and the brush. I can easily account for my appearance in Boulogne. I have come to see my friend and brother. Mr. Dowsett, unsuspecting, for what connection can he trace between me and Lizzie Melladew, will place himself in my hands. He has told me that there is not my equal. He may find that it is so. In order that I may not miss him, I go to the house to-night. Early in the morning come you alone to the Rue de la Paix. You can ride to the foot of the hill, there alight, and on the right-hand side, a third of the way up, you will see my new friend's establishment. I will find you a snug corner from which you may observe and hear, yourself unseen, all that passes. Are you satisfied now that I am keeping faith with you? Indeed, you are proving it, I replied. Give me no more credit than I deserve, said Devlin. It is simply that I keep a promise. In the fulfilment of this promise, both in the spirit and to the letter, my dear sir, I may to-morrow unfold to you a wonder. It is my purpose to compel the man we have pursued to himself reveal all that he knows of Lizzie Melladew. Perhaps it will be as well for you to take down in writing what passes between us. Accept it from me that there are unseen forces and unseen powers in this world, so rich in sin, of which few men dream. See those shadows moving on the water? Are they not like living spirits? The dark river itself, had it a tongue, could appall you. On such nights as this are secret crimes committed by devils who bear the shape of men. What kind of being is that who smiles in your face, who presses your hand, who speaks pleasant words to you, and harbours all the while in what is called his heart a felt design, towards the execution of which he moves without one spark of compassion? I don't complain of him, my dear sir. On the contrary. And here, although I could not see Devlin's face, I could fancy a sinister smile overspreading it. I rather delight in him. It proves him to be what he is, and he is but a type of innumerable others. Your innocent ones are arrogant in the vaunting of their goodness. Your ambitious ones glory in their successes, which bring ruin to their brethren. Your kings and emperors appropriate providence, and do not even pay a shilling for the conscription. A grand world, and grandly peopled. The man who glories in sin compels my admiration. But this one, whom we are hunting, is a coward and a sneak. He shall meet his doom. As he ceased speaking, he vanished. I can find no other word to express the effect his sudden disappearance had upon me. Whether he intended to create a dramatic surprise I cannot say. But, certainly, he was no longer by my side. With some difficulty I found my way alone back to the Hotel de Poilly, where Carton was fast asleep. End of chapter 27